sharing, can I stop sharing? Um, and class, if you can show your slides. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm just going to put my. Have you got these now? Yes, we can see. Very good. I'll switch to full screen and uh, start my my presentation, if that's OK, then. Uh, I apologize if this there's noise uh, coming along, but I hope everybody can can hear me. I'll switch on my camera when the uh, when it's time for questions. But at the moment, I am just going to start my presentation. Thank you very much, Julia, for your kind introduction and for setting setting up everything. Um, this is what I hope to cover today. I will tell you a little bit more about myself and my function in the in the uh, this community. Uh, and then I will switch to to talk a little bit about my current job and my previous job in Granta Design, which I am sure uh, many of you know already. Uh, and I will talk a lot a little bit about uh, software, but a lot about the capabilities and what examples you can do with this kind of software. And then I hope and there I hope there will be time for questions and discussion uh, after this. So uh, let's let's get started. Um, so as you have heard already, uh, I have two jobs. One is the lead academic development manager in uh, ANSYS in Cambridge, and that's my role in the uh, in this this uh, team as well. But at the same time, I've kept uh, also um, my my position as an associate professor of material science. So I still do uh, quite a lot of teaching in a Swedish university, and that has to do with. Uh, mostly mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and those kind of things, but uh, always connect to materials. Uh, my main interests are, are not only materials, but also pedagogy and sustainability in, in general. And I've been uh, active in, in this uh, role in the advisory board together with the others since the start of this, this um, consortium. Uh, here's a brief introduction of my background. I have a PhD from uh, 1993, old one now, and I've done postdocs in in Canada, in Montreal, and I've worked also in uh, southern US, in Georgia, for a while. Uh, otherwise, I've spent the last 10 years or so in Cambridge, in the UK. Um, I've had some interactions with people in, in the, the community, so I would like to highlight uh, Adrian Borion, from UCL, which we I've known for several years, she has come and visited us, and we uh, we have also participated in in courses given by her. Uh, Rupert, of course, at Imperial College, we've been uh, uh, helping out in his teaching of basic material selection, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, collaborate a bit more with one of our uh, people from the group, Shoma, uh, who is now working at uh, Brunel University. Uh, that's a little bit about uh, about me then. Um, uh, class, I can hear. Is that? Is, um, I think everyone's having a trouble with the sound now, right? It's not just me. Yeah, the sound dropped. Yeah, yeah. yeah. can you hear me again? Oh, you're yeah, back. Yeah. yeah, you're back. Okay, yeah. Glitch there, am I back? That'd be yep, good. Back. You're back. Excellent, excellent. So I was just going to tell you a little bit about uh, the background of the company that I work with. So currently we know it as um, ANSYS, and uh, historically it, it comes from a development of Cambridge University by Professor Mike Ashby and his colleagues. Um, the name EduPAC that you may know came about around 2006, 2007. Uh, when the education division was formed, uh, yeah, more than 10 years ago now, to support the growing academic uh, community that's interested in in uh, material selection, and we have, of course, still a big, a big presence in the um, uh, material selection community for for professionals as well. Uh, now, we are currently owned by, by ANSYS, an American company, and you can see to the left there what they're involved with. They have a massive presence in the engineering community since 50 years, years back, and we were acquired a few years ago. 
our profile, uh, you can see that to the right, is more focused um, on material selection and uh, we have a big presence in um, uh, education. So uh, you can see there that uh, we're, we're a part of more than a thousand uh, big universities uh, all around the world and we have a, a big um, amount of uh, resources uh, to cover that. So our part in the ANSYS uh, family then, uh, that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, is uh, finite element based uh, calculations, approximate methods with grids and things like that. Whereas we in, uh, in the, the old Granta community, we work more with experimental data. Um, but we do fit in, I think, in a quite nice way um, among the fluids and structures and 3D design uh, options by, by the ANSYS company. And we complement it with lots of data and knowledge about materials and material selection. And here you can see we, we do have a, a big presence uh, in material selection uh, all over the world, really, in six, six continents. So I travel quite a bit to visit and arrange courses in some of these, these places. Uh, in the UK, of course, uh, that's our, our first and oldest uh, market. We, we are, have a big presence in most important um, universities that do uh, engineering and technical educations anyway. The product then, uh, it's software, as you know, and it contains lots of data. Uh, data on materials and also some tools where you can uh, visualize, filter and select materials among this database. And I'll show you more details about that. Um, we do have and offer a lot of um, resources, educational resources in my, my business. So presentations, case studies, that kind of thing, and, and uh, some uh, conference papers as well. And lots of exercises that are free to use for, for our customers in, in universities. And this is my my own uh, characterization of uh, what what the software does. So uh, in, if we divide it into levels uh, at the at the basic level at the bottom there, it is a database of material properties. Um, so we do have a lot of, of data collected already about uh, all types of materials. And these are then used uh, in our own visualization um, techniques. You may recognize the Ashby charts that are called uh, and to the right, but we have a few variations of those to make it easier to, to visualize for students and to select from, from the materials that you can see. At the top there, I put tools and links. So you can use this data, of course, to, to do uh, eco eco analysis and look at environmental properties of, of products. Um, and you can also select materials based on what kind of properties you want for, for a certain um, product or a certain uh, design. Uh, all right, and uh, we, we have to facilitate, since we have this presence at universities, we found that um, it's easy to overwhelm students if you present all of this data, thousands of, of materials data. So we have a, a sort of a level uh, grading here where we use level one for, for the freshmen and for pre-university teaching. Level two is the, the main uh, use, I would say, that goes to undergraduate uh, courses, about 100 materials of all kinds of, of uh, uh, types and uh, a little bit over 100 manufacturing processes as well is included in this database. And level three we reserve for advanced uh, projects and use in, in uh, advanced classes um, at, at university then. So project work and that kind of thing and advanced higher, higher year uh, teaching. And I still do uh, quite a lot of that as you as you may suspect. Uh, if we look at then the level two, the, the restricted um, database, we, we do have um, data sheets on the computer that look something like you can see here. We have chosen just ABS plastics as an example. Um, it contains a lot of data and a lot of flexibility. So you can click here on more information under each of the, uh, the many uh, material properties that we have. 
If you click, for example, uh, on the uh, Young's modulus there, you will get um, connected to a science note which describes the definition and some basic facts on uh, Young's modulus. And this is very much appreciated by students that uh, sort of explore all kinds of, of uh, properties. Uh, you can also go on and, and look at processes that are connected with, with the certain materials. So if you click the, the link, uh, you will get uh, uh, access to all the manufacturing processes that are associated with ABS plastics, for example. Uh, right. Uh, uh, that was level two. And level three then is for the advanced user. So we have thousands of of uh, records um, on in, in level three, and they are more elaborate. As you can see here, one of the things that they contain that uh, level two usually don't contain are some temperature dependent uh, properties. So you're able to go in and, and plot and use uh, data from, from a certain temperature range, and especially the metals, of course, uh, they, they change properties quite a lot depending on, on a, a range of, of temperature. You can see here also that we have exporters, so you can you can find uh, data sheets and then export them to a large number of uh, different software packages, not only ANSYS, but also Abacus and uh, NX, Nastran SolidWorks and, and packages that you may be familiar with. Um, and if we look at the, uh, the basic level two materials, um, you can you have some examples there. It contains databases on the elements and material science uh, basic uh, data set as well. And you can then go into subject specific uh, databases. So we have a database on sustainability, for example, but we also have uh, like, like bioengineering and as you can see there, the built environment that used to be called architecture. So that might be most interesting for, for you guys that are listening today. Uh, we also have some uh, product specific databases. So we have one uh, designed by Magda Figurola, for those of you who know, who know her, that worked in the company for many years. Uh, and she has then a, a product design database. And we, we do have a, a more dedicated uh, database for medical devices uh, as well. So those are are interesting uh, contributions for, for those who, who um, do specialized teaching. And you have access to all of these functions here. You can browse the data sheets, you can search certain aspects of them, or you can perform a material selection based on the chart, chart select function. Uh, you can also see that we have a basic version of the eco audit, which I will uh, come to a little bit later, that has to do with uh, life cycle uh, investigations. Um, connected to, to products. Uh, I will go on and show you a little bit more on the introductory level here. So you can see here that you, you have some, some tools there and you have a, an integration with simulation, as I mentioned here, SolidWorks and Nastran and Abacus, etc. Uh, and of course, we also have um, our, our own ANSYS uh, packages connected to this. I will continue. Um, if we go to level three, then we have more advanced versions of all of that I mentioned. So we have extensive specialized databases, one on aerospace, for example, uh, there's one on polymers and one on bioengineering. Unfortunately, we don't have any uh, yet any a database on, on this level for the built environment, but we're working uh, towards that. There are also some tools uh, that you can uh, that you can employ. One that's called the synthesizer, which is good for mixtures of materials. So reinforcements, for example, fiber based uh, composites and so on, but also reinforced uh, other reinforced materials. And we have an extended eco audit tool that has greater capabilities on secondary processes and so on. So you can study all the uh, life cycle components of the product. And there are some other uh, additional uh, tools there, find similar tools and an engineering solver and so on. So I won't go into uh, 
those in detail. Um, here is an overview of, of all of those tools in, in the advanced level three of the software. So if we now switch from the content of the software to more the use of the software, who uses uh, this software? We have traditionally built up a big uh, community of materials education users. And you can see here that they cover mostly, I would say, undergraduate studies. So the first, second, third year of university and a little bit of senior uh, teaching also and specialized in, in all of these different areas. So we have uh, mechanical engineering, but we'd also have specialized databases on energy and um, bioengineering and so on, sustainability, as I mentioned. So there's quite a lot, uh, a lot to, to choose from. Um, it's worth mentioning also the approach. So if you've, you've taken a course in, in uh, mechanical engineering or a materials focused uh, course, it's very common and most of the uh, textbooks start then at the microscopic level uh, with atoms and uh, atomic, uh, you know, gitters, that kind of thing. And then in the end, if you're lucky, you will approach um, approach the product uh, that we are. Now, Mike Ashby is a pioneer in, in not only this classic way of, of describing material science, but also in the reverse uh, methodology here, where you start from products and get to understand their properties and strengths and flaws and so on by looking in greater and greater detail into, into the, uh, in the end, the atomic uh, structure of, of the materials. So I would say we're famous for this uh, sort of uh, approach, the, the science-driven and the design-driven uh, approach, I think, to materials. Here's just an example. Um, I have a few examples before we switch to the, uh, the questions. This is what you, you find if you, you choose the built environment uh, level two database. So you can see it's organized there uh, according to the different material, material groups to the left and also to their function in the building. So we have the, uh, the enclosures, interiors and so on, superstructures uh, available in this database. And you, you have an, a little excerpt, a little example from Portland Cement what you can see, it contains pictures at level two, it contains descriptions of these materials and then a list of uh, the individual um, material properties that you can see. And uh, we are famous for, of course, these uh, so-called Ashby charts. And here's an example where you, you have an overview of, of all the different uh, families of materials, the technical ceramics, polymers, metals, and so on, mixed with uh, natural materials, foams, and non-technical ceramics. So this is, is great to have a, a database that collects all of these different material groups in one, one database. And they're designed so they should be comparable. Uh, so they are complete in the data sets and they are made to be uh, comparable in the quality of data. So that's a great relief, I think, if you have struggled with, with comparing different data databases in the, in the past and uh, find that they, they don't use the same terminology or the same standards of, of measurements. So uh, I have one more picture of those. So uh, the way you select materials in, in one of these is that you pinpoint what properties you're after, and then you have various tools to find the best materials that fulfill your required uh, properties here. So here we see a, a singled out carbon footprint of primary production uh, combined with yield strength of materials and these these materials then might be uh, fulfilling some standard in your application that you need. A quick look at one other uh, data table. As you saw, we have many, many different kinds of data sets. Um, one of the more fun, fun ones is uh, one that contains uh, structural sections. So we have a, a database on uh, lots of these different standard profiles where you can go in and find find the data for eye sections for example or or uh, other uh, other desired uh, structures 
Um, Mike Ashby is famous for um, making this selection methodology uh, popular, and he has written a great number of textbooks. I've singled out here uh, the undergraduate textbook on material properties and the advanced level, which is used in many, uh, many master's educations as well, of material selection, where it outlines all the principles of how to select the best materials for your products. And you can see here to the left the, the schematic uh, representation. So it's based on, on uh, studying all the materials that are available and then narrowing down by, by looking at certain functions and certain constraints and objectives that you have in your design. Uh, then you use it to screen and to rank and to find the top materials. Uh, so that's a great relief. Now, I would like to mention also some some of the eco data and the eco functions that we have because this is a lot about the circular economy and the uh, the environmental thinking that we have in our uh, our consortium. So uh, Mike Ashby has uh, his own slight um, va variety of of uh, a life cycle uh, thinking. So you can see here uh, the resources that he considers. He, he has simplified the whole thing into mainly energy use and uh, the material uh, content and the carbon emissions of, of a product. And we still have the four main steps of a life cycle assessment. So it contains the material production, as you can see here. It contains the, the stage in the factory where you have the product manufacturing going on. Uh, and we have singled out also the use of the product that we consider. Uh, and it's end of life where we have several um, possibilities here. We're going from landfill, combustion, all the way to various forms of recycling and uh, repairing, re-engineering and even reuse. So there's data on all of these uh, parts of the uh, life cycle of a product. Um, now there are some simplifications, so we don't consider in detail all the, the emission gases, only an effective uh, carbon dioxide equivalent uh, emission. And I would say also it's simplified in the use of uh, just the energy that is used in the, in the, um, uh, in the life cycle of a, of a certain product. The transport is separated, so it's a fifth independent unit of this. So compared to the life cycle assessment standard, uh, we've taken out the transport parts here and we consider them in a, in a certain stage. But there is data for the most common uh, types of transport modes. And here we see a direct comparison with the, uh, the life cycle assessment standard, the, the four steps, the goal and scope, life cycle inventory, impact assessment and the interpretation. Uh, and we compare it with our eco-audit uh, methodology, where we have simplified the life cycle to four main life cycle phases plus the transport considered separately. The two main uh, components here is the resource, the energy, uh, and the emissions in carbon dioxide. So that's a great simplification. And that's what we, what we need to just to find the most essential things in product development and the effects. Uh, all right, so the results come out in terms of energy use and carbon emissions. Uh, and there is a version also that considers cost in this context. So a quick example, here is a, a typical life cycle of a product uh, from the material exact uh, extraction to the end of life. And uh, we have various studies uh, where we have tried to figure out what happens at the end of life, a certain secularity and the use of secondary raw materials going back into the manufacturing process again. So you can read more about that in some of our conference uh, proceedings. But the basis is the life cycle tool, I would say, uh, that we have. I've made some, uh, some progress in trying to elucidate um, elucidate this, uh, and I compare it to the circular economy uh, model that we have here with uh, the resources coming at the top, streaming through the different uh, processes of, of production, and then the possible leakage uh, after the, the 
product is formed. And this is a user-centered uh, model. Whereas we that work with uh, ANSYS and, and EDUPAC, we have more of a product-centered uh, version of this, where we consider the simplified resources going into the process and certain leakage in form of waste, but the possibilities to to reuse, remanufacture, and recycle the components of a product. Um, let me just point out a few things that we consider relevant and that you can find in the database. So these are relevant for circular economy, of course. Uh, the different uh, kind of um, energy and, and carbon that is involved in using each material. Uh, we have also the possibility to go into individual elements. So we have one database on materials and one database on, on elements, where you can see uh, everything from various properties to where these are sourced as well, as well as the, uh, the carbon footprints, etc. Uh, we also put some effort into critical lists, so we know which materials are, are critical and not. Um, and then uh, you can use um, various parts of the data and make these fantastic plots. So we have, for example, uh, plots covering the greenhouse emissions on, a, on an international scale where we have different countries in a database called uh, the nations of the world. Uh, another example is a database that is connected to legislation.